right, so my name is Justin Duncan. I'm a sustainable agriculture specialist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology. And um, I, I was really happy to be a part of our uh, CIG project down there in the valley to look at cover crops. Because before I was at NCAT, I was uh, the greenhouse manager at Prairie View A&M University. And um, while I was taking care of the horticultural research plots there, uh, it was the drought. Um, I don't know if y'all remember, but back in 2010, 2011, we had a horrific drought in Texas. And it turns out that all the stuff that I learned during that drought are all applicable to um, growing conditions down there in the valley. So this was a fun project for me. Um, and I'm going to talk to y'all about some of the things that we found and, and uh, that we learned. I can figure out how to make the screen advance. All right, so um, I like to define cover cropping. Um, I like to define uh, I like to define cover cropping as uh, using crops to provide a barrier between the soil and degradation. Uh, cover crops can be used to smother weeds, protect soil from erosion by wind and rain, um, build and conserve soil organic matter, and allow better rainfall infiltration percolation and storage. So, um, you know, cover crops, they basically slow down any sort of um, issues with the soil. So like uh, down in the valley, we see lots and lots of open land during, uh, during off seasons when it's not being uh, cultivated. Um, and that allows for the wind to pick up that soil and, and, and just carry it off. And, you know, that harkens back to, um, you know, the Dust Bowl era back in the, in the 20s when uh, the predecessor of the NRCS was born, the Soil Conservation um, Service, um, you know, they had, they had the con uh, conservationists go out and tell people, you know, how to, how to fix their soil, how to keep their soil in place. But, you know, here we are uh, years later and, down in the valley, we're still seeing uh, open land and, and, and all that. And so cover crops, they like, they prevent that, that blowing effect, that, uh, that erosion. They also uh, prevent like when it rains, uh, if, there's, if there's just bare ground, um, there's nothing to hold that water in place. And so that causes uh, gully erosion. And, um, you know, the water, it, it runs off instead of percolating or infiltrating in soil. So cover crops allow uh, rain to, you know, stay in place and get down into the soil and go down to the water table where it belongs, rather than um, becoming surface runoff and going into the streams and rivers and, and into the oceans and all that. Um, cover crops can serve other purposes, such as uh, livestock fodder. Um, you know, a lot of these things are high protein. They're great for uh, cattle or goats or other livestock. Um, you can also use them as a host plant uh, for beneficial insects. And this gets into another presentation I do called farmscaping, where I talk to producers about uh, how you can grow crops that attract beneficial insects or insects that are predators, parasitoids, and parasites of pests. So cover crops can allow uh, those good insects to build up in, uh, in decent populations to help you um, protect your crops from, uh, from pests. And they can also serve as companion plants in some capacity. All right, so companion planting can be defined as establishing two or more plant species in close proximity in order to reap uh, benefits such as pest control or high yield. And I kind of just uh, touched on that. Um, when, it, when it mentions higher yield, um, this to me is especially looking at uh, the legumes because legumes, they, they uh, accumulate uh, nitrates and once they are uh, terminated or killed and incorporated in the soils, uh, those nitrates can be uh, become available for the next crop. And so, you know, when you've, when you've got like systems where um, 
And, you know, you're using a lot of nitrate, such as if, if you're growing, uh, growing cotton or, or corn or other heavy feeders, um, these uh, cover crops can help you restore the soil, restore that, uh, that, that uh, the nitrogen minerals back to the soil. Um, companion planting can be considered a small scale practice, but it can also be practiced in larger parcels. And uh, we've got some publications um, through, through ATRA, and ATRA is our service um, where we provide information to, uh, to farmers. So we've got some publications on there. Uh, we've got companion planting, and then the other one is, um, uh, I forget it, I'll, I'll get to it in a minute. All right, so um, companion planting is is one of those things where it's it's simple, but the way it works is very complicated. Um, so farmers and gardeners have over the years developed combinations that work for them, and they've passed them down from generation to generation. But science kind of looks at this like, ah, that's old wives' tale. That stuff doesn't work. But in fact, science proves that companion planting works. So it's kind of funny. Um, so um, the problem is that all the links in the chain aren't seen as the chain itself. So you have all these folks, they have all these different uh, disciplines, they focus in on their discipline, and they don't look at how their discipline relates to other disciplines, or that's, that's called over compartmentalism. Um, and then, you know, generally, uh, um, in, in general, over the years, we've become more uh, overly reliant on, uh, on chemicals instead of looking at how nature uh, solves different problems. All right, so one way that um, cover crops can be used as a, uh, as a companion plant is in a trap cropping situation. And it, in a scheme, in a trap cropping, in a multiple trap cropping scheme, you have different trap crops, or you have the same trap crop in different physiological states. So in this scenario, let's, let's say that the crop is cotton, and then the trap crop one is, um, is uh, alfalfa, but the alfalfa is at a very young or a very recently mowed state. And then trap crop two is still alfalfa, but it's, um, it's older, it's, it's, uh, it's more mature, um, it's, it's a bit uh, more thick. And then trap crop three also still alfalfa, but it's, um, it's flowering and it's ready to be mowed again. So in this type of scenario, um, they were using it, using it in cotton to control um, certain insect pe uh, pests. And I think in this case, it was uh, ligus bugs. Then you have a uh, push-pull trap cropping, which I'm really excited about because it's, it's taking advantage of um, a, a crop's ability to repel certain pests and also another crop that attracts the pest that you're trying to get rid of. Um, this was figured out in, in Eastern Africa. And once they figured this system out, um, within a matter of months, you know, no longer than a year, over 10,000 farmers had adopted it because it was so helpful in helping them um, overcome some of their uh, crop issues. So when it, I've got on the, I've got on these uh, columns, um, push crop. They don't necessarily have to be in this arrangement. They can also be within the, uh, the crop. The idea is just that you're planting the push crops in and amongst your, uh, your, your, uh, your cash crop so that they repel certain insects or the pests or or even in some cases it helps reduce disease or it helps uh, reduce weeds. And a one, a one uh, instance where this works really well is with, uh, with Striga. And thankfully we don't have Striga in the United States, but it's, um, it's a parasitic weed 
that just destroys um, corn production or maize production in, in Africa. So that's why the uh, why the farmers were so uh, so hastily adopting this technology because uh, it's really helpful with striga. All right, so one cover crop that we didn't look into enough was uh, was clover. Uh, we we grew it several times. It did not do well. Um, this is it planted with some uh, with some broccoli and. I was using this at Prairie View and it, it was a really nice system for me because I would plant a field in, uh, in crimson clover, let it grow, then let it go to seed and then mow it and incorporate it into the soil. So over the summertime, the seed would be dormant and it would just sit there and not do anything. And then over, you know, I would grow my crops during the summertime and in the fall, when I took the summer crops out and started uh, preparing the field, then the, uh, the clover would, would germinate. Once the clover germinated, I would transplant broccoli into it. So while the broccoli is uh, growing, you know, it's, it's coming in as a transplant. So it's, a, it's larger than the clover seedlings. So the broccoli has a head start over the clover. Um, it grows, it gets big, you harvest it. And after the season is finished for the, for the broccoli, the clover is now filling in that field. It's, it's filling up that spot and taking over and suppressing weeds and enriching the soil with nitrogen and providing a nice place to stay for the insects uh, and, uh, uh, and spiders. And um, while, the, while the broccoli is growing, the clover is providing uh, a place to stay for the uh, beneficial insects and predators and all that. And so they, they uh, move from the, uh, the clover up to the broccoli and, and keep the broccoli pest free. The only pest that it really didn't work against for me was birds because you know the birds, they would go out there and they would sit on the, uh, on the broccoli and do their business. And now you can't use that broccoli head because the birds have done their business on it. But other than that, it, it really, uh, kept the broccoli um, pest free. Now, what we saw in the valley is clover or, or crimson clover really did not perform well for us. It, it, up in Prairie View, it gets, you know, over, over a foot tall, 18 inches, two feet tall, and it's vibrant and lush and beautiful. Down in the valley, it's sickly. It didn't get over six inches tall. Um, even when it was flowering, it was just, it was just unhappy. But um, I wanted to try it again because, you know, it was one of my favorite things to grow. And so I, I tried it one last time and I noticed that the, uh, the weeds were suppressed, even though the broccoli, I mean, even though, even though the clover did not grow well. Coming into the spring, we really did not see a lot of germination of, uh, of uh, pigweed or careless weed or amaranth or whichever you want to call it. We didn't see a lot of germination of it, nor did we see a lot of germination of, um, uh, what's the stuff called? Um, hold on, what's that weed? I'll remember it in a minute. In, in, in a minute. But um, there were several weeds that it suppressed, and it, it suppressed them at really, really surprisingly high proportions, like, you know, 95 to 99%. You know, there was just no amaranth in that field. While around the edges of that field, it was covered in amaranth. And, you know, it's, it was, like, really amazing to me. I didn't get to re repeat the experiment, so it's only ant anecdotal. Um, you know, data, it's, it, it doesn't go anywhere until I can repeat it several times and, and um, you know, ensure that it's a real thing. So don't quote me on it yet. I'm just saying, just sharing what I saw, just an observation. Now, some other cover crops that we looked at were, oh, oops, I jumped the gun, hold on. All right, so let me, let me explain some processes that are going on. Um, cover crops, um, I mentioned that they protect the soil. And the way they do that is they're shading it 
And so that shading allows soil moisture to build up. It allows uh, fungal hypha to build up. And that's very important because fungus and plants, they, they form an association called mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza acts as an additional root system for plants. So while the root ball of, a, of one of your vegetable crops or, or you know, one of your row crops, that root ball might be eight to 10 inches, maybe, maybe 12 inches um, across. Now, what the fungus does, what the, uh, the mycorrhiza does, is it attaches to those roots. And as long as there's living roots for it to attach to, it can spread everywhere. So now you've got a plant that's connected to minerals and water that are, um, you know, like 100 feet away. And that's really great because this, this internet that, that the plants and fungus um, develop allows plants to communicate uh, uh, chemical information to each other and to the fungus. So the fungus is building, is, is bringing uh, minerals and, and uh, water to the plant. The plant exchanges, um, you know, the, the mineral and water that's delivered to it for carbohydrates. And, you know, it's, it's just this whole nice community that they've got going on in the soil. However, when you don't have uh, cover over the soil, when the soil, soil is just continually exposed to the sun, um, you don't give a chance for the fungal hypha to develop and, and spread and all that sort of thing. So also on the shaded side, you, um, you get, get a buildup of organic matter. That's where the uh, fungal hyphae are, are living and enjoying. And then the, uh, the temperature in the root zone is a lot lower in, um, in a, in a uh, the soil that's been uh, shaded by the canopy. So, you know, this, this is very important because um, when there's no shade, when the sun is just exposed to, when the, when the soil is just exposed to the sun, uh, you've got, you get a lot more uh, evaporation. Um, the temperature in the soil is higher. And so since the temperature is higher, you get less organic matter. If you get less organic matter, um, you get less ability for uh, water to be held in the soil, and that just makes the ambient temperature hotter. And so this, this creates what is like an upward um, spiral of just um, badness for the soil. All right, so in cooler areas, um, they have more soil organic matter, and that organic matter is, is more sensitive to loss uh, at higher temperatures. So in a cool area, if the if the average temperature, if the average temperature uh, rises one degree Celsius, you expect to lose ten percent soil or organic matter. In a warm area, that same rise will only result in about a three percent loss of soil organic matter. The problem is between the um, between the the cooler area and the warmer area, the quality of the soil organic matter is a lot higher in that cooler area because. Um, in the warmer area, you're left with um, basically the, the more uh, lignified debris and, um, or, or more woody debris. And that, that takes a lot longer to break down, but it's also a lot less uh, available to the, uh, to the plants and, and crops and all that. All right, so um, soils maintain a large reservoir of water in their organic matter, the hotter it becomes, the more water is lost. Um, the loss of organic matter leads to a loss of water holding capacity. And it, like I said, it's just a, it's just a uh, self-replicating cycle of heating. Um, now, if you're trying to keep up, um, you have to understand that in hot and humid areas, you need twice the inputs of organic matter to maintain fertility. That's not every year, that's each growing cycle because these plants are, you know, they're basically using up this organic matter and it's breaking down, you know, from the environment as well. Um, in no-till systems, you, you lose about half of con uh, conventional tillage. And um, the, the problem is that it's like, Using no-till, sh everything should equalize out, but it doesn't because you can't incorporate 
um, all this um, all this extra organic matter that you add. All right, so um, another good thing about soil organic matter is that it disperses negative effects. Um, organic molecules bind to toxic, uh, toxic soil minerals. And these are things like, um, like aluminum or magnesium or iron. Um, and those things are reduced to less toxic levels by dispersion in humus. And, and humus is, um, it's, it's that organic matter that has you know, broken down into undifferentiated stuff. You know, it used to be leaves or it used to be twigs or whatever. And now if you look at it, it's just this brown stuff. You can't tell what, what it came from. Um, now maybe in, uh, in the valley, aluminum isn't uh, such a problem, but I know salt is down there. And so or, soil organic matter helps with, uh, with salt dispersion as well. Um, so I don't, I don't really believe in composting and don't get mad at me and, and come at me with, uh, with torches and pitchforks and all that because I'm not a composter. Um, and it's just because in hot and humid areas, um, it increases the volatilization of nitrates and, and carbon from the compost. So compost is an exothermic reaction. It releases a lot of heat. Well, it's already hot. So if you're composting and you're trying to get, you know, all of the benefits of compost, you start off with this huge pile of, of, of you know, material. And at the end of your composting uh, process, you're left with this little bitty pile of material. So I really don't like composting. Um, what I do is I just compost in place or, or use deep mulching um, because that slows down the process a lot and conserves moisture for me. But you might have different results. Anyway, um, so manure, it is also very beneficial to the soil. Um, and if you're in uh, certified organic, there's, there's regulations that you ha have to adhere to. And then manure is really bulky and messy to move. So um, for you know, row crop producers or, or vegetable producers, um, you'd also have to maintain a, uh, a, a herd, your own herd of animals so that you can make this manure. But with cover crops, um, you can grow uh, organic matter in place, and there's no withdrawal period, which the uh, organic regulations uh, uh, require. Uh, recover crops add nitrogen uh, because legumes and rhizobium and all that, and it moves minerals from the subsoil into the topsoil. And this is very important because a lot of the a lot of the uh, minerals are lost when you harvest. So, um, well, in the upper few inches of the soil. Um, a lot of those minerals are, are removed when you harvest. So when these plants can, you know, use their roots to go deeper into the soil profile and pull up minerals and get them back into circulation, that's, that's an important quality. Um, then you can also uh, mow and incorporate your cover crops or you can mow, uh, mow or mulch or you can use no-till. So how do we choose our cover crops. Um, you have to look at different, um, different soil considerations. You know, what's the pH? What's your soil texture? Is it droughty? Does your soil flood? Are there diseases present? Um, one thing that I really like is to get familiar with your seasons and, and cycles. Um, what is your, and, and you know, that's, that's important because you have to know your land. You have to know what your land is doing, what the season is doing, and uh, when they're doing it, and, you know, how does that relate to your crop and your planting and all that sort of thing? Because you wouldn't want to plant a cover crop that is, is going to be in its uh, main vegetative uh, phase while you're supposed to have your, your main cash crop in. Um, you know, what's the next plant, uh, next crop you're, you're planting? Um, is there a lilopathy? And some of these cover crops that I'm going to talk about, you know, there is an interaction that's negative. So you have to be aware of, uh, of a lilopathy when you're choosing your cover crops. And then equipment requirements. Do you have the right equipment to, um, to maintain your cover crops? Um, and not a lot of vegetable uh, uh, not a lot of vegetable producers have a lot of hay equipment 
and hay equipment is basically what you use to maintain your cover crops. And then also you're going to look at uh, weed control. Uh, what weeds do your um, do your cover crops control, or do your cover crops control weeds? Um, so the cover crops that I'm going to talk about were the ones that we looked at in the uh, Lower Rio Grande Valley. Um, these are just handy facts. They're no by no means uh, comprehensive because we're still not finished, and there's still a lot for us to uh, to figure out. Um, but for more information, you can refer to the related publication in ATRO, which is cover crop options for hot and humid areas. And let's look at some stuff. Oh, I like legumes because legumes build nitrogen. I kind of talked about that earlier. Um, some rhizobium, or which are the bacteria that form an association with, uh, with legumes, some of those bacteria, they can persist in the soil better than others. And you don't need to... Um, you don't need to reapply uh, rhizobium every time uh, you plant. Others, they're more ephemeral. Uh, they don't last long, and they must be applied at each plant. Thing. Um, all right, so I want to start off with sorghum, sorghum Sudan. I, I'm not a real big fan of grass, but I have to admit, through the course of, of this project, I... I I have to respect sorghum Sudan grass um, or hay grazer as some people call it. Um, it's, it's great for um, suppressing nematodes and it loosens subsoil. Um, it can help you build the soil because it produces huge amounts of biomass. It's really great in the valley um, for producing biomass. This stuff gets, gets tall and it covers, keeps the soil covered. Um, it's, it's pretty great. It's also a nitrogen scavenger. So what that means is like if you fertilized with, uh, with a nitrogen source in your, in your uh, previous crop, then um, you plant some sorghum Sudan grass or some hay grazer, and it, it grabs up all that extra nitrogen that was left over from that previous crop, and it kind of locks it in its biomass. Um, it's, a, it's, it's really a great weed suppressor. Uh, you know, I had to see it from my own eyes. Uh, it, it made me a believer. Um, but yeah, in between the, uh, the, the sorghum Sudan grass uh, plots, there were just, there was just no weeds hardly under that canopy. It was a beautiful thing. Um, it's really good in rotation with onions. And that goes back to what I was saying about allelopathy. So sorghum, sorghum Sudan grass, um, doesn't have an allelopathic effect with onions, but it can have allelopathic uh, properties with other crops. So I give sorghum a plus. Uh, sorghum Sudan grass a plus. It's great. That's what it looks like. This crop and this uh, field has just been mowed and they're still in the process, but it, it really makes a great canopy and there's not really a good opportunity for weeds um, to, uh, to develop under that canopy. All right, the other thing that was my favorite, my, my top pick, because it's also a legume, um, is pigeon pea. Now, I don't know if, if y'all made it out to the pigeon pea field day we had. Um, this, this crop really overperformed. Uh, it's it, it's kind of new to the valley. Uh, I've seen some, some folks, they grew it up in uh, Northeast Texas, and they were looking at it primarily as a, uh, as a fodder crop for their animals. Uh, but people in the valley had, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone had, had grown it until we grew it. But um, at the field day, people loved it to the point where, you know, when they saw it be green, when everything else around it was dead, um, the first thing they asked was, can I feed it to my cattle? And of course, you can feed it to your cattle. Um, and it's really good for them because it's, it's uh, full of uh, protein. The next thing they did, which was surprising to me, is after the field day was over, people were like pulling plants up. They, they, wanted, they wanted the pigeon peas like you know, so badly, they, they pulled plants up and took them home with them. And that, that really shocked me. But it was, it was a pleasing sort of shock because I was like, all right, we, we did something that people found beneficial. But um, 
Pigeon peas are a widespread food crop, in, uh, food crop in tropical areas. Um, people in India mainly eat it, and then it's eaten in Africa and the Caribbean, and it's spreading to South America now. And so hopefully we can spread it to South Texas because um, it, it grows really great there, and it's a good protein source. It also fixes nitrogen, about 250 pounds per acre. It uh, makes about 2.5 2 tons of, uh, of dry matter per acre and 35 tons of fresh weight per acre. That you know, fresh weight means that you harvest it when it's, it's uh, green and you, and you weigh it all out. Another good uh, property is that the roots exude pisidic acid, and this releases insoluble phosphate from the soil. And what that does is like if you've got, if your soil test comes back and it says, oh, you've got phosphate, but your plants really can't benefit from that, 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 uh, that phosphorus in the soil because it's bound. It, it, it can't get into the plant. So uh, pigeon peas, they break that bond and allow that, uh, that phosphate to become free or the phosphorus to become free in the form of phosphate. So this is a drought hero. It is like absolutely drought tolerant once it's established. And I was kind of worried about them when I first started, uh, you know, planting them because they, they grew slowly at first and I had to go out there and, and actually hoe in the field and, and baby them a little bit, not with water. I had to baby them against weeds because the weeds grew a lot faster than them. But once their canopy closed, and once the roots got down into the into the soil profile uh, and reached the water, they took off. They were amazing. And like when I say amazing, uh, they flowered at four feet, and that's as big as I thought they were going to get because they were a determinate type. And uh, when I came back, there had been a rainfall. They had grown an additional two feet and were still flowering and fruiting and all that sort of stuff. Um, one of the most important things about this crop is um, it's got a full canopy when most things in the valley are dead from the summertime. And I mentioned that it rained. When we went back out there, a couple of weeks after it rained, it was the soil was still wet in between the rows. Now, in the adjacent field, all that soil was dry and hard as a rock. So if that canopy is, is so dense that it can keep that water in place and even be you know squishy in the field when you walk out there, I think that's a winner. So we give Kajanas Kajan or Pigeon Peas a plus. That's what Pigeon Peas look like. Now notice on here, there's a little insect damage in that pod. Um, that's, that's the thing I need to work out next uh, when I grow these again, so how to protect these from uh, the pod borers. Uh, that's our field. Uh, that's the uh, pigeon peas growing back there, and this is how tall they were. They were taller than me, and it was really nice to walk in that canopy because the temperature cooled down. Um, it was like a, a 10 degree difference um, from outside and inside the field. All right, so the next thing is uh, Cassia uh, rotundifolia or Cassia uh, fasciculata. These are also known as Chemicrista. These are a native uh, plant, and um, you don't want to raise them if you've got cattle because they can be toxic in later stages, but uh, they're another uh, win down in the valley. They grew uh, very well and, and did everything that they needed to, and they provided a food source for pollinators. That's what they look like. You've probably seen those driving around. Um, these are uh, some lab lab and uh, Cotillary or, or sun hemp on the right, on, on the left, excuse me. And on the right, we've got buckwheat. All right, so, and I'm gonna show that picture again in a second. Uh, next is um, iron and clay peas or Vigna unca colada or cow peas. These also did really, really great in the valley. Um, they get another plus. That's what they look like. And then uh, Centrosema molly. Or pubescence or soft butterfly pea. These did not do well in the valley at all. They don't don't try it. It's a waste a waste of time. That's what they look like. Well, and I say they're a waste of time because I did not baby these crops. 
Okay. I put them out there in the, in the rack and blast of, of summer heat and um, they didn't, they didn't do so well, but it's cousin uh, Clitoria turnitea uh, or turniata or butterfly pea. Um, this one did pretty well. Uh, there were several accessions in our, uh, in our trial. They made it all through the summer. They grew well. Um, they didn't need any irrigation or anything like that. Uh, these are also a medicinal plant. Uh, they make a, a, a blue or purple tea out of these flowers, and it's a very good um, antioxidant. The last really, really big winner was uh, Crotillaria gentia or sun hemp. Uh, these are awesome in the field. Uh, they're very good for uh, suppressing weeds, and they grew through the summer and all that sort of thing. And like the uh, pigeon pea, they picked up on the natural uh, rhizobium in the soil and um, they, they grew very well. So those get a plus. The others, oh, that's the um, sun hemp right there. Uh, the others, desmodium, that's what it looks like. Lab Lab, Lab Lab does, does okay sometimes. Um, that's it, uh, the seed pods and all that. And then um, velvet beans. Velvet beans do well if they're irrigated. That's what they look like. And then uh, and also the, uh, the scarlet runner beans, the Faseo Faseolus coccineus, uh, they do well if they're irrigated. The stylosanthes, uh, those are being tested over in uh, Corpus Christi for me. I'm waiting to hear back on results. All right, so a special thanks to the USDA, our CIG grant with NRCS and uh, ATRA which is funded through rural development. For more information, you can hit, hit me up on my email and I'll be glad to answer your questions. All right, so that's the end. All right, what questions do we have? We have questions. Uh-oh. First, first of all though, um, you, you must have touched on at least seven or eight different kinds of cover crops and some you gave pluses, some were no-nos. Are you available to help producers um, try to figure out, like study, study what they have at their own operation and figure out which is best for them? I, I'd be glad to do that. Um, I, we're not really traveling too much because of, uh, you know, some random virus that's floating around that's got us all masked up and whatnot. But uh, otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm readily available through my email um, and I can talk producers through uh, whatever issues they're, they've got. Okay, great. Well, we'll put your your email address again in the in the chat so that all the attendees can see. A few more. Is alfalfa a good cover crop? Will it put bad nematodes in the soil? All right. So I haven't grown uh, alfalfa, but I I don't see it as being a good cover crop for uh, the valley. Um, you know, it's just because of the places that I've seen it grow, like out in West Texas and, and all that, where um, they don't get the blister beater, uh, br ah, blister, I can't talk, blister beetle. And um, the valley is one of the places where the blister beetle would be. Um, so I wouldn't grow it because of that reason. Okay, thank you. Um, so Joyce, that was Joyce Salinas who asked, maybe um, get with Justin and see what would be better than alfalfa. Another, why would clover do worse in South Texas versus the coastal bend area? All right, so clover is a, is a winter legume. It likes cooler temperatures. And so, you know, it, up, up here, like I, I'm, in, I'm in Prairie View now, up here, you would plant clover in October and it would have a, a slow buildup and it would, uh, you know, get uh, into a good solid vegetative uh, uh, phase in, um, in like February, uh, February to March and bloom out in April and be done in, in May or May to June. And so you don't really have that, that, uh, that, that seasonal setup in the valley that you do up here. It's more temperate up here, y'all are more subtropical down there. And so it's really hot when the, uh, when the clover needs to be establishing. And so it really doesn't uh, flourish down there. And then the other thing is that your, your soils are a bit different. 
Um, you know, there's many different uh, types of clover and they flourish in, in different soils. So I'm sure that there are some clovers that would do well down there. It's just that I was fixated on crimson clover because that's what I was most fam most familiar with and, and had the best results with. Um, I think uh, other folks have uh, used that, uh, that, that white clover or the Dutch clover down there and got better results. But I personally have not used it down there. Besides organic matter, what else can be used for high salinity in soil? You know, I haven't really had to deal with, uh, with saline or, or uh, sodic soils. Uh, we've got a new publication through ATRA that you can access, and it will give you all sorts of uh, information on how to fix that. Um, but the other thing that, that, you know, I know to use is leaching. And, you know, if, you're, if your irrigation water is salty and you're trying to leach it out, um, that's, that's not very helpful. So you have to leach it by rainfall. Um, what I would suggest is, is switching over to crops that, that have a little bit better salt tolerance mm -hmm. instead of trying to force non-salt tolerant crops to grow in that soil. Okay, a couple more. Do cover crops need to be rotated? Um, I mean, that depends. If, if you see disease issues uh, pop up on your cover crop, then yeah, you're going to need to rotate them. Or if you have like a, a pest that uh, your cover crop is very susceptible, uh, susceptible to down there, then yeah, um, you need to rotate it. Um, but gener generally, you know, cover crops are grown because they don't have those issues. Mm -hmm. They do, then yeah, definitely switch them out. Okay. Can micro mycorrhizae be Mycorrhiza. added to the yes, thank you. Be added to the soil? If so, where can it be purchased or acquired? So I I have some misgivings about buying mycorrhiza because you know folks are gonna try to sell you stuff, right? And they're gonna say that their mycorrhiza is this and that and the other, but nature already has mycorrhiza. The only thing that you need to do is is make sure that the soil conditions are, are proper for the local mycorrhiza to inhabit your soil. So once you make the conditions right for mycorrhiza, uh, it'll, it'll pop up on its own. And uh, like, like I'll, I've, got a, I've got a huge uh, uh, wood chip pile. And you know, whenever I catch, uh, whenever I need some, I always catch the, uh, the tree trimmers and you know, I'll chase them down and say, "Hey, come dump, uh, come dump your wood chips over at my spot." And I let that uh, I let that that pile decompose for a year before I mess with it. Mm -hmm. But when it, once I start uh, moving it, you can see the mycorrhiza threads just all woven through there and attached to the tree roots and all sorts of stuff. And it's it's you know kind of exciting for me because I I love this stuff. It's my friend. It's my buddy. Great. Okay. Another one last acquisition question. Since these crops aren't normally grown here, here being the valley, where do you find the seeds? Okay, so uh, email me and I can get you a source for uh, pigeon pea seed. Uh, we got it from a guy named Jimmy Gitt, and he's the producer in Oklahoma. He worked for ARS for a number of years under the scientist that developed um, the GA2 uh, variety of pigeon pea. So he's got like train car loads of the stuff up there. Uh, in fact, and, and don't tell him I said this, but um, we, we, we got our seed from him and he never charged us for it. He just sent it to us. So... <laughs> I, you know, and I've, I've emailed him, you know, several times since then. And he, he just, you know, never really worried about it. He, the guy is very well off. So I'm, I don't think he really worried about that, but um, we, we've still got plenty of seed. Uh, we might be able to send you some. Uh, the other ones, uh, a good supply, a good supplier is, uh, is Hancock seed. Uh, they've got, you know, sun hemp and, um, the, the other stuff. And then if you go to your local, uh, your, your local supplier, 
your feed store or whatever, they should be able to order um, some of this stuff. Thank you so much, Justin, for all of that and for making yourself available to uh, our producers, our attendees. Hey, well, it's no problem for me. I, I hope they got something out of it and enjoyed the, enjoyed the presentation. I'm sure we have. I'm sure they did. Thank you.